Welcome. I have a few copies of that article too, if anyone wants a hard copy to read on the flight home as opposed to an electronic copy, see me afterwards. Okay, here we go, wonderful, great. All right, now, let's see if this works, there we go. Why does North America enjoy over four times the GDP per capita of South America? Why, come on, am I doing something wrong? <clears throat> okay, there we go. Why was Botswana the fastest growing country in the world from 1965 to 1995? Well, in this talk, we'll find out. Uh, it's not just a question of how much regulation, but what kind of regulation. And so here's our agenda for the next few minutes. First of all, we'll talk about how economies and societies are complex systems. We'll look at organic regulation, then imposed regulation, talk about its public choice con concerns and unintended consequences of imposed, then look at the comparative impact of both of those on entrepreneurship, innovation, and economic growth. We'll look at a real live case study of drones, how they can be governed by each type of regulation, and finally, recommendations. Okay, great. Well, um, I've been privileged to be involved with a place called the Santa Fe Institute in Santa Fe, New Mexico since 1990, and I've been a trustee there since 2008. Founded in 1984, the Santa Fe Institute studies what the economy, the environment, and the brain have in common. They are all complex systems. That is, order emerges from the bottom up rather than by top-down design. Unlike, say, a jet engine, which is designed from the top down. So a jet engine would be complicated, but it's not complex in this sense of the word. Uh, here are uh, examples of, uh, or ways that, here's what it means for a system to be complex. Order arises bottoms up, so people give rise to customs, buyers and sellers give rise to wages and prices, companies give rise to supply chains and ecosystems. Variation in products and services and technologies and selection by consumer demand and business demand give rise to innovation and evolution. These uh, complex systems are never at equilibrium, despite what they taught us in Econ 101, but rather they're dynamic and they are constantly attracted to lower energy, lower risk, or higher payoff states, which are uh, attractors. Uh, there are feedback loops, which make them nonlinear and unpredictable, and if you try to constrain them from the top down, you get unintended and typically undesirable consequences. Now this complex systems framework suggests a new way to look at regulation of economies and societies as either organic or imposed. So economies and societies are, are regulated organically. We forget this. Uh, most of the news, public discourse, and uh, pub popular mind share around regulation relates to statutes, regulatory agency, promulgations, and executive orders. But we forget that economies are already in, uh, inescapably regulated by customs, markets, private agreements, and common law. All of these arise not from top down, uh, not top down by legislatures or dictators, but uh, bottom up by the distributed action of millions of people and thousands of judges taking place in parallel. Uh, and uh, how do they emerge and evolve? By individual self-organizing, by buyers and sellers self-organizing, and from variation and selection, in the case of common law, variation through court cases and judges, and selection in appeals courses. And I'll say more about common law in just a moment. So uh, this, these, th collectively, I refer to these forms of regulation of society as, and economies as organic. They are emergent, they are inescapable, uh, even in dictatorships where there's little in the way of freedoms, we still see black markets and underground markets emerging. That's organic regulation uh, uh, emerging uh, despite the, uh, the top-down regulations. Uh, many actors and systems, uh, uh, many actors and decision makers make the systems hard to corrupt. Now, 
Uh, imposed regulations lie on top of organic regulation, and they are statutes, regulatory agencies, and executive orders. And you know how these evolve and emerge uh, by bills being introduced, negotiated, and voted into law by agencies and politicians defining and enacting regulations and orders, and of course when they're amended, that's how they evolve. Now these then don't evolve smoothly, uh, rather they evolve erratically and they tend to accumulate. And since you have a central decision maker, it provides a single point of failure if the legislative body or the dictator makes a mistake, that affects everybody, and vulnerability to corruption. Now let's look at the history of the common law and uh, statutory law uh, briefly. Uh, common law originated in medieval England with the Magna Carta back in 1215, which originally limited the rights of the crown just over barons, but which was later demanded by an extended commoners. It provided for private property, no taxation without representation, and juries of peers. It's often referred to as judge-made law because it's made by judges throughout the courts of the land rather than by legislatures. It was very modest and is very modest in its goals. All it does is resolve disputes. Uh, it often doesn't try to set policy precedent. It just uh, resolves disputes. Uh, it often uses the reasonable man or person uh, standard. What would seem reasonable to a reasonable person? And this standard means that the law evolves with the customs and the, of the society. And so it reinforces and co-evolves with customs and technology. Especially early common law was uncodified. It wasn't even written down anywhere. It just uh, uh, existed in all of the court cases that preceded. Uh, and <clears throat> so it evolved as the cases were decided. Uh, and it provided not rules, but uh, guidance and standards. It's uh, open-ended in that it doesn't try to anticipate all the problems or situations that may arise. It only addresses them as they arise, and so it's, um, it's, it's economical. Uh, even the notion of stare decisis or let standards be, uh, or let precedents stand, came along fairly late in the development of common law. Uh, after the printing press was invented, I talk about that at greater length in the article. So uh, the former British colonies have inherited British uh, for common law traditions. Uh, uh, and that means the US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Hong Kong, South Africa, India, Botswana, and, and many others, and some others. Now in contrast to that is uh, continental civil law. And this uh, originated in Roman times when emperors and legislatures provided for rules for judges to follow. It was reinforced in the early uh, 19th century by uh, Napoleon through the uh, Napoleonic Code, which brought, codified all of French law. It brought clarity and consistency and nullified much prior law. But, and it also, most importantly, helped Napoleon consolidate power because judges became administrators who could only apply law, not make law. Uh, it disempowered judges from finding better resolutions. So if two litigants and a, law, and a judge could agree on a superior outcome for both parties, that was not allowed on, uh, under civil law. So you can see how it already started to disallow people from self-organizing for optimal benefit. This became the legal regime of choice for political leaders throughout continental Europe and most of the world. Uh, Damaska refers to it as policy implementing versus dispute resolving, uh, uh, civil law versus common law. And interestingly, England has had legislation since the Middle Ages, but before the 20th century, according to these two scholars, it was used sparingly and reluctantly. Okay, just to be very clear, civil law has two meanings. It can mean either one, non-criminal law, in which case it's distinguished from criminal law, and two, it can mean legislative, statutory, and administrative law and regulations, and there it's distinguished from common law, and of course it's in this second sense that we're using the word here. Now, uh, <clears throat> France, Spain, and Germany and their former colonies have all inherited primarily civil law traditions, and that's most of continental Europe, Latin America, North Africa, and Asia. 
But as we'll see, every country in the world uses a mix of the two. Now, how do the two evolve? Uh, there we go. Well, common law, as we've seen, evolves con continuously through real-world cases. And many decisions are taking place in parallel throughout the land. There's variation and selection. There's variation because different judges and courts and situations will decide things differently and a selection by appeals courts, so you can see how there's a natural evolutionary process that takes place there, sometimes referred to as a structure without design. I uh, view it as analogous to the ant hill. None of the ants design the hill, and yet its shape and is fairly predictable, isn't it? Well, uh, broadly similar here. Uh, uh, as a result, common law is less predictable short term because you never know how a particular case will turn out, but it is more predictable than civil law long term. Taleb refers to uh, common law as anti-fragile. Now, civil law, in contrast, uh, evolves not continuously, but at fixed points in time when laws are drafted, vetted, and enacted, and when they're revised. Uh, it, and they are, tend to be more predictable short term, but less predictable long term because huge changes can take place overnight. The kinds of changes that you see with Sarbanes-Oxley or the so-called Affordable Care Act where huge changes were implemented overnight, you would never see that in common law because things evolve much more gradually and smoothly. And so there's much more opportunity for regime uncertainty in civil law than in common law. Okay. Now, all countries, as I mentioned, use both a mix of, of common law traditions and civil law traditions today. Uh, civil law is often merely common law codified at a point in time. For example, in the US, uh, criminal statutes are mostly codifications of common law, common criminal law. Civil law is widely used uh, as more practical and efficient or necessary, either when cases are uh, very numerous and similar, for example, traffic violations, or for public goods and commons, for example, air pollution and national defense, where property rights are not well defined to avoid tragedies of the commons. So, and, and these are widely seen as being more practical than having judges handle case to case. And I'm not going to make the case here that we should always use common law or that we should only use common law. But uh, the broad, the the space that common law is being applied in is getting narrower and narrower, and it's being encroached on by civil law, and so the mix is becoming more and more suboptimal. So the trends are civil law has increasingly is increasingly supplanted common law. Here's how one uh, scholar characterized the United States in the last 50 to 80 years. The U.S. has shifted from common law defined by courts to statutes enacted by legislatures as the primary source of law. So even the U.S. is primarily shifting. Let's look at two aspects of civil law, namely public choice concerns and unintended consequences. First of all, what is public choice? Just to refresh your memory, uh, oops, thank you. Uh, this is the one that says public choice concerns, that's it. What is public choice? It's how economic and other incentives unrelated to public welfare influence the law and regulation. So for example, a, pol a protection of politically favored businesses and lobbies in the law from competition, generating agency revenue, uh, insulating bureaucracies from risk. Judge-made law is much less susceptible to these kinds of issues because there are so many decision makers that make the uh, decisions hard to corrupt. And uh, in the next slide, I have a long list of, of examples of public choice concerns. I won't go through them one by one. I'll just say that even President Obama, before the end of his term, recognized the harm that was doing, being done by uh, uh, occupational licensing, precluding people from earning a living. That's an example, of course, of, of uh, a civil law that uh, generates revenue. Uh, but uh, in some cases, uh, people had to shell out a couple of thousand dollars to get a license to braid hair a safe and uh, practice that goes back thousands of years. It's, and I think what got President Obama's attention is it's mostly young black women who braid hair and who were precluded from making a living for themselves uh, through these regulations. Uh, so uh, that's uh, public choice concerns. Unintended consequences, whenever you 
disallow people from self-organizing. They will try to optimize the situation as much as they can. Here are some examples. The Affordable Care Act converts full-time employees to part-time, where we've seen lots of cases of that. That's disadvantageous for both the employees and the employers, but it's uh, necessary under that, or it's, it's the optimal state under that act for many companies. Uh, minimum wages drive reduced use of low-skilled labor and increased use of computers. Uh, rent control means low, less high-quality and affordable housing long-term. High taxes on cigarettes and alcohol lead to black markets. So again, policy implementing versus dispute resolving. Now, let's talk about how civil versus, how imposed versus organic regulation affects entrepreneurship, innovation, and economic growth. Three things that I know are important to all of you in your startup cities. First of all, in uh, uh, entrepreneurship, well, imposed regulations deter entrepreneurship in three ways. One, getting started because of those licenses, for example, we were just talking about. Innovating because so much of innovation budgets have to be applied to dealing with regulatory issues and expanding. Uh, many uh, imposed regulations kick in after a company reaches a certain size, say 50 or 100 employees. And one of the challenges uh, in dealing with imposed regulations is that there is no one silver bullet. Depending upon the industry and the type of business, any of these many different uh, regulations may be the most onerous candidates. Incidentally, this chart and others are in both the book and the article. Uh, here's one way to think about the impact of imposed regulations. Think of any metric of entrepreneurial effectiveness that you wish. It's probably some index of uh, skills, passion, perseverance, self-confidence, ambition, resources. Using your index, your composite of those or perhaps other factors, Think of the rating and distribution of all uh, uh, entrepreneurs along that index. Well, it'll probably form some kind of curve, maybe a bell curve like this. Whatever index you use, however you define it, there will be some number of entrepreneurs, especially at the low end of your index, who are being blocked by regulation. Uh, and uh, over time, the numbers being blocked each decade are increasing. These data are from uh, one of the uh, Department of Labor studies that are cited in the article where the average number of new businesses created for every 10,000 working age Americans has declined from 27 in the 90s to 25 in the 2000s to 22 in the 2010s to who knows what it'll be in the next decade. So entrepreneurs are being blocked. Here's a graphical way to see the impact on innovation of regulations. Let's say that five years ago, an, an, a regulation was introduced that disallowed something. Uh, maybe it was uh, sharing of vehicles. Maybe it was drones in your yard or neighborhood. Maybe it was uh, using uh, <clears throat> certain types of electrical signals in gameplay. Now fast forward five years. Uh, new, uh, uh, new, new forms of collaboration and cooperation between people have arisen thanks to advances in technology during to those five years. And what had been a single dimension of possibilities uh, that was disallowed is now an entire half space of possibilities that is disallowed. Now let's further uh, fast forward uh, another five years, and we see that uh, that smooth surface is now a irregular uh, surface that takes time and money to explore because uh, amendments have been negotiated to that regulation. And exploring all of those nooks and crannies of that irregular surface uh, take time and money to explore, which is advantages the well-funded, connected, and influential giving rise to cronyism. So uh, a graphical way to see the impact on innovation of imposed regulations. Here's one more way, and that is that imposed regulations turn positive sum environments into lose-lose negative sum environments. Uh, there are over 100,000 entrepreneurs and startups squeezed into the tiny health and fitness mobile app space today. Most of those startups will not survive. 
the market just isn't that big. Uh, in contrast, there are relatively few uh, entrepreneurs in building construction, aviation, food processing, uh, housing. I could go on and on. Why are the, there so many fewer startups in these areas than there are there? Well, largely because it's less regulated. Uh, health and fitness mobile apps, mobile apps in general. The less wittingly or unwittingly entrepreneurs are attracted to the least uh, regulated industries. Less capital is required, There's, uh, it's easier to get started, and that uh, is a lose-lose because, uh, and if just a few of those entrepreneurs could be freed up to uh, uh, work in this much larger, these much larger spaces, it would, uh, many more of them would be successful and uh, humanity would advance much more rapidly. Uh, finally, the, imp the correlation of common law with economic growth, this widely cited study uh, by three professors, probably the best of whom is Andre Schleifer at Harvard, called The Economic Consequences of Legal Origins, looked at uh, the countries that use common law versus civil law and found that uh, greater use of common law was associated with all of these uh, socially desirable and economically desirable outcomes. So uh, it really is the case. Another, so let's return to our original question that I started the talk with. Why does North America enjoy over four times the average per capita income as South America? Well, the US and Canada inherited British common law traditions primarily. South America primarily inherited European continental law and civil law traditions. Uh, and another uh, paper that I cite in my paper says that as over the decades, North America has enjoyed over half a percent greater GDP growth per year than South America. Uh, and indeed, if you do the math, uh, the ratio between these two uh, factors is 4.4 uh, between North America's GDP per capita and South America today, according to the International Monetary Fund, and if you take a number slightly greater than half a percent per year, namely 1.006, 1.005 would be half a percent, and raise that to the 250th power, you get approximately 4.4. So you can see the, the impact that this can have over the long haul. Let's look at my other uh, case that I mentioned at the outset, which is why has Botswana why did Botswana enjoy the fastest growth of any country in the world uh, from 1965 to 1995? That is an, aver an average annual growth rate of 7.7%. Well, it inherited not one but two forms of common law, namely tribal, its own tribal, and British. It was a British protectorate after 1885, but the British uh, governed it very lightly and gave stature to its own tribal law. Uh, and uh, so it benefited from both of these traditions when it gained independence in 1966. Let's look at a real case study of drones. So all of you are familiar with drones. They have many applications shown here. There are also very significant risks of drones. They can fall, they can collide, they can intrude on, on your privacy with cameras. So how are drones currently regulated? Well, they're currently regulated by the Federal Administration, Aviation Administration. These are some of all of the uh, regulatory uh, regulations that control the use of drones. They have to be well away from airports, can only be up to 400 feet. They have to only be used during day, during visual sight of the operator. There has to be a dedicated operator, only one operator per drone for non-commercial purposes. If you want to uh, uh, veer away from any of these, you have to have an explicit um, uh, exception from the FAA. Uh, what innovation has this regulation disincentivized? Well, such features as drones recognizing airborne objects, other drones, so it can avoid them. Extrapolating the position of another drone so it can, or airborne object, so it can avoid it peer-peer communications between drones so they can avoid each other. The outcomes of this are that the U.S. has fallen sadly behind in international drone production, both military and commercial, 
Uh, the top drone manufacturer today is DJI Technology in Shenzhen. Uh, two thirds of the U.S. market is over two thousand dollars is owned by Shenzhen by DJI, and uh, this, the number two vendor has dropped out of the market. That was uh, 3D Robotics, and they're now just doing software. Now, how would you govern drones using common law? Well, you would hark to precedents. And there are plenty of precedents that could be applied to drones. Uh, that long on the books have been dangerous animal laws. An owner is responsible for the behavior of a dangerous animal that it owns. If, you, uh, if your animal uh, destroys property or hurts another person, you, the owner, are responsible. Similarly, peeping tom laws have been on the books for centuries. Uh, it's illegal today to peep secretly into a room occupied by another person or to secretly video or photograph that person. Great. These could be applied to drones as well, either with or without cameras. And uh, so we don't need a huge body of regulation to govern drones. We can simply hark to precedents that have long been there. Common law also provides for strict liability if uh, if uh, a manufacturer is, is negligent or for, for willful misconduct as well. So recommendations uh, for startup societies. <clears throat> Start with a uh, minimal kernel that provides freedoms. Speech, free trade, currency, labor, capital, property. Separate state from church, economics, education. Provide in some fashion for dispute resolution, either public or private. Then extend private property as much as possible to minimize tragedies of the commons. And to uh, remember, this is where uh, civil law uh, can be applicable. So for example, the ground under your land or the airspace above your space, of, above your land, where, where uh, should the lines be drawn? Uh, I, I, I can talk at much greater length about this if anyone is interested. And let the law evolve with society, customs, technology, and the economy. Uh, when you do choose to use civil law, or it seems to be the most cost-effective option, let it emulate common law as much as possible. First of all, make it responsive, that is permissionless, rather than prescriptive. Uh, intervene only in the case of a dispute. Uh, focus on objectives, not specifications. For example, drones will operate safely is a much better law than drones will operate within visual sight of their operators during daylight hours only, etc. Start general and evolve to reflect common law court cases and norms. So as it becomes natural for drones to have more and more features like uh, sensors to detect other drones, then you can take the liberty of, of considering that in the law the requirement for those, and provide large spaces for, for learning and freedom. For example, drones may operate freely up to 400 feet. So, and for any new imposed regulation, uh, this is a, a long list of features, bound its applicability, limit the number of words and pages, create regulation free zones. Do this for two reasons. One is uh, to ensure continued innovation within the zone and two is to better assess the impact of regulation outside of the zone. So even if you're thinking of putting a new regulation in place, be sure to set aside a special economic zone where the regulation does not apply so we can do a natural experiment and see just what the impact of that regulation was on innovation, entrepreneurship, and economic growth. Require innovation impact assessments just as we have environmental impact assessments before a new regulation is put in place, ask what impact is it having on new innovation? Test on small scales, use sunset clauses, and most of all, use organic regulation instead. Thank you very much.